Today, I'm going to talk about measurement errors and the importance of accounting for them as we analyze data. Specifically, I'll illustrate this importance in the context of a very common type of problem that arises in practice known as total least squares problem. Every time we make an empirical measurement, there is noise associated with that. It can be low or high, but there is no such thing as measurement that is noise free. These errors should be part of our analysis and the larger they are, the more important it is to incorporate them in the analysis. As I'm going to illustrate today, uh, they can substantially alter the, the results of the analysis to the point of even changing the conclusion as my last slide is going to illustrate. So let me start by introducing the simple case when we have measured two variables, x and y, across four different uh, conditions. In this case, the, the measurements, the data points are depicted with the solid circles. If x is known exactly, or the, or the error in its measurement is very low, when we fit a model into these data, the model here is illustrated with a dashed line, we want to minimize the difference between the model and the data points. And this difference here corresponds to the vertical line segments that connect the data points to the model. This problem is known as partial least squares and it's the ordinary regression that many of you are perhaps familiar with. Why is it partial? It is partial because it accounts only for the errors in y, which is usually the uh, dependent variable and doesn't account for the errors in x, the independent variable. The case where we account for the errors in both x and y is shown to the right. And in that case, the difference between the errors that you would like to minimize uh, is depicted with the line segments connected the data points to the model. And these line segments are now perpendicular to the model, to the dashed line. As you can see, they have both X and Y component, and therefore as we minimize them, we minimize the errors both in X and Y. I verbally explained those two different cases, and this verbal description has an exact uh, equivalent in, in math that can be rigorously defined. In the first case, the partial list squares, we are minimizing the residuals in y, so r sub y is a vector of residuals in the y dimension. And this minimization might be, might be weighted by a matrix w, for example, the diagonal weights, if the errors are not correlated, that tells us how much weight to put on each data point. In the case of the total list squares, as you might expect intuitively, we have a term both for the errors in y and for the errors in the x direction. And in this case, they're weighted by the inverse covariance matrix for, uh, for these errors, taking into account the possibility that there is dependence between um, errors for different data points. Okay, so that's the theory, um, a little bit of math, but does it matter? To illustrate the difference, I simulated data from a generative model, a very simple linear generative model indicated here on the left, where the dependent variable y is simply equal to two times x. Furthermore, I, I added the same amount of Gaussian noise, both to y and to x, which corresponds to um, measurement error, 
For example, if X and Y are two different proteins, uh, that would correspond to our error in measuring them, or if there are two different metabolites or messenger RNAs, or if X is a protein and Y is a phenotype of interest, and we want to quantify what is the strength of the relationship between the abundances of protein X and the phenotype Y. The data points again are the solid circles, and you can see that if we fit uh, the partial least squares, we get a line with smaller slope than if we fit the total least squares. And if you look at those, they both appear somewhat reasonable, and you might think, so what's the big deal about that? Well, the deal is that the partial least square and the partial least squares incurs a systematic bias. And one way to visualize this bias is to simulate the simple model a thousand times and then plot the distribution of slopes from the partial least squares, in this case here shown with the right distribution, and the total least squares, in this case here shown with the blue distribution. And as you can see, the blue distribution is centered exactly at the correct slope of two, that's what my generative model is, that's what I'm simulating, while the red distribution gives me systematically smaller slopes. In this particular case, this could have been easily derived analytically, the exact bias, but I thought that the simulation provides a more intuitive illustration of the, of the problem and also gives me the opportunity to, to give you a problem set for you to simulate the same problem and in addition test a couple of different levels of noise in the data to see how this, the bias of partial least squares changes with the noise, uh, the measurement error that is in both X and Y. And you can find the detailed instructions for this problem in the description and comment sections of this video. Now, how did they solve the total least squares problem? Generally, total least squares problems can be solved by defining a new matrix, in this case, matrix A denoted here, as having the columns uh, X here of the predictors or the independent variables. In, in the previous case of my model, it was just a single vector because it had the single um, uh, independent variable. And we just append to the right the, the columns uh, that we would like to, of, of the dependent variable of, let's say the Y phenotype. And then solving the total least squares problem corresponds to finding the null space of this matrix A. If the problem has an exact solution, then A is going to have null space. In the real world scenario where we have measurement error in both X and Y, the measurement error is going to contaminate that now space, so it's not going to exist, but we can still find uh, the approximation of that now space. We can find the, the vector that gives us, that when multiplying the, 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 the matrix A on the right, gives us a very, very small vector, very close to the O0 vector. And and there is, th this is well understood approach. I'll, I'm not going to go much into the theory here. I'll just uh, mention that intuitively this makes sense. Why? Because if both X and Y have errors, we would like to treat them symmetrically rather than putting them on the different side of the equation and doing different things to them. And here you can see that they're part of the same matrix and they're being treated in the same way. And why is a now vector then a solution? Because the linear combination, the elements of, of that now vector that correspond to the 
uh, linear combinations of x that equal the corresponding values in y are going to give us um, the solution that we're looking for. In the simplest case, which is the case simulated on the preceding slides, when the, the errors in both x and y are sampled from the same distribution, we have about the same measurement error when we measure metabolite A and protein Y or protein X and uh, protein Y, uh, then the approximate null space of A can be found uh, to correspond to the right singular vector of A with the smallest singular value. And that is the approach that they used in the simulation that they showed today. If the errors of A, uh, if the errors in X and Y are sampled from different distributions and vary substantially, the, problems become, the problem becomes much, much harder. Uh, but there are approaches that can still allow us to find approximate solutions that take into account all of the errors and uh, we have worked on one such problem uh, for the case known as structured total list squares. Why is it structured? Because the errors have structure, the errors in the matrix A, how much we want to vary the elements of matrix A have, uh, have structure and uh, if you read the uh, paper reference below uh, you can you can find one approach to solve this problem using a convex solver. Convex means that the objective function is convex and therefore we are guaranteed to find an optimal solution. And what this approach is essentially doing is perturbing the elements of matrix A until we can find the A tilde matrix, which is as close as possible to A that does have a null space. And of course, that null space corresponds to the solution. Why is this taking into account the errors? Because the magnitude of the perturbations on each element of A is proportional to the error that uh, we think is, is present. And you can also find the code for, for that solver, as indicated below in, in our GitHub page. I, I spoke a little bit today about total least squares, but this is certainly not the only or not even the major example of taking into account uh, errors in the data. Uh, there are many, many other uh, examples that are mostly beyond the scope of our discussion today, but you should always, always think about the errors in the data that you're analyzing. Or another way to flip this around is, think about the reliability of the measurements. What fraction of reliability, in this case, is a technical word, what fraction of the overall variance in your data is due to signal versus the total variance, which is due both to signal and to noise to, um, that takes into account the measurement errors. And as I promised at the beginning, uh, here is one example where accounting for the errors in the data makes a substantial difference in the overall conclusion. Uh, in this example, we performed joint analysis uh, between RNA and protein levels measured across a variety of, of human tissues. And we wanted to know to what extent the uh, protein profiles of each tissue uh, is, is being shaped by either the messenger RNA abundance by transcriptional regulation or by post-transcriptional regulatory mechanisms such as protein degradation or uh, uh, RNA translation or protein synthesis. And when we, to do this analysis, we estimated empirically uh, what is the reliability of both messenger RNA levels and protein levels. And as you can see uh, in panel E to the right, uh, the result from this analysis, the degree to which uh, protein levels are uh, set by transcriptional or post-transcriptional mechanisms, is a very steep function on the reliability of the data. Depending on how high the reliability is, the data indicate either that most of the regulation is due to transcriptional 
or otherwise to post transcriptional mechanisms. And you can read more about this in the paper reference at, at the bottom of the slide. So with this, I'll conclude the today's lecture. And if you're interested in learning more about this topic and other related topics, you can find additional recorded videos on our YouTube channel um, whose URL you, you see it at the bottom right.